Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for coming and uh, attending today's event on uh, the technical feasibility of conflict prediction for uh, anticipatory action. For everyone's um, awareness, please note that we are recording the event and we will be sharing the recording publicly later. I will briefly introduce um, the panelists for today's event and the agenda. And, but please note that uh, it will be presentations followed by a Q&A session. And given the attendance numbers, uh, attendees will remain muted, but you can put all of your questions into the chat box, which we'll be monitoring. And we will pull out uh, questions for use in this Q&A session. So to introduce um, all of our panelists today, starting uh, from the top left, we have um, Ovar Hegre, who's a director of views and a research professor at Prio slash Uppsala University. Uh, Marie Wagner, who's a project manager at the Global Public Policy Institute. Um, Kathy Kishi, who's the head of data science um, at ACLED. Aaron Lintz, uh, an associate professor at the University of Texas. Uh, myself, Seth Caldwell, a data scientist at the OCHA Center for Humanitarian Data and Leonardo Milano, who's the team lead uh, for predictive analytics at the OCHA Center for Humanitarian Data. So if we go to the next slide, please. Um, today, really, the event is here to discuss a paper that we've just published uh, at the OCHA Center for Humanitarian Data, where we're trying to assess the feasibility of applying conflict prediction for humanitarian anticipatory action. And I will start by presenting a summary of the paper and our findings there. Um, Ovard will follow with uh, kind of a perspectives on the state of the art work in conflict prediction. Aaron Lintz will talk about a um, similar topic, but uh, for humanitarian research and food security prediction. And Marie Wagner will talk about the current landscape on anticipatory action in violent conflict situations, more from a practitioner's side. And we'll follow this with Leonardo moderating a panel discussion uh, question and answer session uh, with Katyun uh, participating in that as well. So we can go to the next slide and I will um, start us off here with the summary of the paper and the findings that uh, the OJA Center for Humanitarian Data has, has come up with. So next slide, please. To start the presentation, I think it's important to lay out uh, exactly what anticipatory action is, because what we were assessing is not the technical feasibility of using conflict prediction for peace building or disaster risk reduction. We're specifically talking about its application for anticipatory action. And anticipatory action uh, and how we've been working on it from the OCHA Center for Humanitarian Data side and other actors in this forecast-based financing space, look at it as essentially applying um, some type of prediction of future shock to ensure that humanitarian action can be done prior to that shock occurring. And the idea is that we can reduce the impact on affected populations by responding earlier um, rather than responding solely after the shocks occurred. And it can provide a more efficient response. And it can also be more dignified. And overall, if we can predict these shocks, there's a lot of value in being able to act earlier. Typically, the way we've been applying this uh, from our side has been on anticipating drought or floods or typically other climate related shocks. And we would set some type of trigger parameters for these early warning signs that could then trigger the humanitarian aid that in the theoretical framework would provide these benefits and the reduction in impact on uh, these populations. So if we go to the next slide, please. We wanted to explore how feasible is this to apply in the case of conflict, as we know that conflict is a key driver of humanitarian need. Uh, across the countries that we work in. And for anticipatory action, we need uh, robust forecasting that's uh, you know, embedded in the clear decision-making process. And that is, we know we can trust 
the models and have some confidence that when we make uh, we make a prediction that we know a certain shocks will occur, that a certain impacts on populations will occur, and we know what we need to do to then lessen the impact on the on those populations, and these fit into pre-agreed action plans and financing that enable those operations to be extremely quick, uh, which is obviously necessary when we're talking about anticipating events like a flood or even drought. So if we go to the next slide, what we, what we assessed was uh, this feasibility of a blind conflict prediction for anticipatory action. And again, we're not answering questions on using conflict prediction for these other purposes, although some of the findings may still hold and you can find more details on that within the paper itself. So if you go to the next slide, the general summary of the findings is that we find there's insufficient justification for applying conflict prediction uh, for anticipatory action, particularly using conflict uh, prediction modeling alone. There's, number one, uh, poor performance in predicting the onset of new conflicts or even intensification of existing conflicts. And, you know, as we've seen recently with the Ukraine crisis and uh, pre previously um, in Syria and other, and other countries we work in, this is often a critical moment where we may be wanting to act anticipatorily. Even more importantly, while we can predict conflict, there's often a lack of connection between that conflict that has been predicted and humanitarian impact on the populations we want to serve. And for anticipatory action, this is, this is quite critical because the pre-agreed action plan and finances, financing requires an understanding of what those impacts will be to ensure that programming and strategies are designed to respond to those specific needs, either to prevent them from occurring or alleviate them in the future. And lastly, uh, in the literature, it's very clear that the ongoing conflict is a dominant predictor of future conflict. Not that you can't necessarily slightly improve your modeling by adding a variety of other indicators, but given the dominance of ongoing conflict, there should be a lot of justification to sort of extend uh, programming and action to areas where there might not be, where we might predict um, that a conflict onset may occur, which again, the performance is much less clear in those instances. And this is unique to conflict, unlike droughts and flooding, where it's difficult to just respond where an existing flood is to, to respond to those populations that are going to be affected by the next flood. Um, with conflict, it's the case where we're kind of responding in areas where we're already he most heavily present and where most of our resources are already allocated might best serve the populations who will be impacted by future conflict. So we'll go to the next slide. It's, so it's not that uh, we're saying that uh, some type of hypothetical future, this isn't feasible, but that today, we don't think that there's a there's justification for just relying on conflict prediction models for anticipatory action. But we laid forward in the paper, uh, a sort of pathway or recommendations where we believe work in the next, you know, period of time, maybe a few years, maybe in a longer term, we might push the research agenda forward, practitioners can, you know, do work on their own, and hopefully together, create a landscape where this becomes feasible. And our recommendations are um, for those actors, particularly in the humanitarian space, who often may undertake their own modeling exercises or applying the models of academic researchers, ensuring that we're using flexible models that incorporate as much data as possible. There's often a trap in the models that we have assessed where uh, a lot of focus is put on identifying particular indicators or particular themes that they think drive conflict, but getting caught into that is often not the most effective for what should often be a just wide ranging system, incorporate as much data as possible to capture the complex dynamics of conflict. We should focus again on trying to improve the predictions of conflict intensification or onset. These shifting points, which may be critically important for uh, work like anticipatory action. To achieve some of these goals, we believe that the use of human inputs, uh, often discussed things like super forecasters or prediction markets, um, may provide 
uh, improve performance uh, to match local realities on the ground and may also be a valuable asset for linking the prediction of conflicts to the predictions of humanitarian impact. And that includes also using locally generated data that might not be available in global models. And the next slide, please. Um, and again, improving the you know, predictions on humanitarian impact, that's, that's probably the most critical point out of all of them. And we believe that you know, all of these uh, other points can hopefully drive that research agenda forward. We, again, hope that for all of the work that we've done in assessing model performance, we're reliant solely on the researchers themselves making public the performance and metrics and the evaluations of how the work that they've done is. And this is not always the case. And it's critical that this is done to ensure that any future developments are able to be assessed in a similar manner. And we can have a public and transparent process as we push this research agenda forward to build trust in a kind of buy in from the most important stakeholders and ensure that it's done in a responsible way. And lastly, that we hope that engagement between humanitarian practitioners, policymakers, and researchers can ensure that the kind of state of the art research that's been undertaken in the academic community um, is best fit for application in humanitarian response, and that both groups can learn from each other and drive this forward. And altogether, we hope this provides a, a space moving forward for potential feasibility of conflict prediction for humanitarian action and anticipatory action in particular. So I will stop here and next slide, please. We will uh, now hear from Oban Hegre. He's the director of the Violence Early Warning System and a research professor at the Peace Research Institute of Oslo and Uppsala University, a leading, leading figure in kind of the academic field of conflict prediction, who's going to let us know kind of the current state and uh, hopefully provide, uh, again, an idea of where they're moving forward in the future and how this might um, be used by kind of practitioners and policymakers on the humanitarian side. Over to you, Ovard. Um, you're muted. Sorry. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the interesting paper you, you produced and to, for the opportunity for me to participate in this event. So um, I agree forecasting armed conflict and onset in particular is very difficult, in part because all decisions are made inside someone's minds and this information is perception and bluffing is central in these decisions. All of this is very hard to measure and put in prediction models, so the problem is hard. But the first thing to note is that we actually made great strides over the past decade. The first academic articles that made meaningful predictions for conflict into the future appeared only about 10 years ago. Since then, the community studying such prediction models have grown exponentially, as has the community of potential users, and the models are now steadily improving. Um, the views team, for instance, just raised a prediction competition that attracted strong contributions from 15 distinct research teams. I'm very happy to see that these were useful for your, in your work. Such efforts are really effective in pushing the work forward and we are preparing a new one. And there are also new, now a few early warning systems that are publicly available and provide monthly or annual forecasts. So conflict or forecast.org and views is shown here. So these systems perform well and score well in terms of transparency and openness. So how to move forward? I strongly agree that transparency is key to the progress we're making. The views competition would not have been possible without the shared data set and the willingness by all participants to be evaluated according to strict but transparent criteria. More we as sorry. More we as um Developers of systems should work with you as users to identify the best criteria to optimize on. One reason that early warning systems do best at predicting continued conflict is that a few instances of conflict onset tends to drown in a high number of observations with continued conflict. It's quite straightforward to re-optimize in a way that places more emphasis on onsets if that is preferred by users. This will not immediately lead to perfect systems, but it's a promising avenue. We also need more publicly available data, data that can be accessed easily, used freely, and can be scrutinized closely by those that seek to evaluate early warning systems. The system will not be better or more transparent than input data. Next slide, please. 
the views team has um, next slide please uh, the views team has recently been developing models to predict the number of fatalities in conflict not only a dichotomous onset or continuation we base our models on the Uppsala conflict data program by far the most transparent conflict data source in existence um, so we seek to country the many challenges involved such as the distribution of the variable and the complexity of uh, um, models so I can talk more about the details in the Q&A we also seek to make everything we make publicly available the forecasts the code used to derive them input data explanations of how we work as well as the evaluation of predictive performance next slide please so the performance of this system is already quite good we think in particular for ongoing conflict um, I can also talk more about that if interesting in the uh, Q&A uh, or in the panel. As measured by the USDP, we predict more than 1,000 deaths in Ethiopia over the next 12 months, 5,000 in Somalia, 2,000 in Yemen, and similar numbers for each of the continuing years. So, as I said earlier, there is more uncertainty regarding new or escalating violence than ongoing war. But seen from the perspective of knowing where people are killed in armed conflicts, we should note that most of them are killed in ongoing wars. And this has implications for anticipatory action and the prediction of impact. So next slide, please. Um, so the views team recently got funds to work on anticipating the impact of armed conflict in a given location. So the impact, not only the conflict. We'll do this in a risk framework, putting it together an interdisciplinary research team. So the risk of, for instance, famine or excess infant mortality is a function of hazard, exposure and vulnerability in this framework. The hazard here is past or future conflict in location. What already happened in, for instance, Western Nigeria and what our model expects to happen. Exposure is how the extent to which a local population is affected by violence and vulnerability is the ability to cope with the violence in this effect. So back to this problem with onset, although better onset prediction models will help modeling the adverse impact of armed conflict, good incidence models are also useful for impact evaluation since the consequences tend to grow as conflicts carry on for many months. Also analyzing exposure and vulnerability, we think will allow us to distinguish between incipient violence that's really threatening to local populations from the violence that is less harmful. So, these are more of a optimistic view on what's possible in the future for, for these efforts. We look forward to continue to engage with you and OCHA and other interested parties as we develop this further. So, thanks. Thank you, Howard. I think we can go to the next slide. And following on um, from Ovar's presentation, we have Aaron Lentz, who's an associate professor at the University of Texas and an expert in the field of humanitarian research, and in particular on topics like food security prediction. So can provide a lens into the modeling techniques and efforts that they've undertaken in the humanitarian space. Uh, over to you, Aaron. Thank you, and thank you everyone for joining us. As Seth mentioned, I work in the food security space, and so I'm excited to learn from um, this space as well. And I think that's one of my most, uh, one of my main takeaways is there's a lot of opportunity here for, for cross pollination, um, because a lot of the issues that uh, those of us who are trying to estimate and forecast food insecurity are similar to the issues that folks are facing in the conflict prediction space. Um, just as in the conflict space, there's been an explosion of research in food security prediction. Um, here's a handful of, of articles that have recently come out in just the last few years. Um, and some of the findings that we think might be relevant for the conflict space is first that not surprisingly data sparse locations are least likely to be well estimated. Um, and so there are some techniques that we've been starting to use in the food security prediction space, such as oversampling the tails, and that can help improve model performance. So that goes back to something that Seth had commented on earlier, where it's easier to predict ongoing conflict than new conflict. And so maybe thinking about these rarer events in innovative ways could be helpful. The second piece that I want to talk about um, is that, you know, just like conflict, there are many different ways to operationalize food security for either predictions or to assess kind of current status. Some of the ways that people have estimated food security is with the integrated food security phase classification system as their, or sorry, classification um, 
outcomes as their sort of output variable. Other folks have looked at a variety of household level food security measures, and some have used different combinations. It turns out what you're estimating will influence how accurate you are. And that's similar, I suspect, in the, in the um, conflict space. So for example, are you interested in whether or not conflict is going to happen? Yes, no. Do you care about fatalities? Do you care about conflict counts? These are all different sorts of outcomes that really could potentially drive what your model, what models look like, but then also sort of what the actual results are in that and their accuracy. And so this is, I think, a, an ongoing challenge that we as modelers face is what is most appropriate and most helpful for the stakeholders involved. Um, so just as there's a variety in the food security space, I can imagine in the conflict space, there's some other questions sort of beyond fatalities and kind of conflict counts. Does it matter if it's a state or non-state actor? Um, is there a threshold? Is there a magnitude? What are the sorts of, of types of, of outcomes that, that are going to be important for anticipatory action? Can I have the next slide, please? There are also some opportunities. Um, as Seth mentioned, you know, transparency and reproducibility are paramount as we in the humanitarian space are kind of starting to think about modeling and Specifically, I think there are two other opportunities that we need to be aware of. The first is a concept of co-production. Um, models are built with assumptions, just like mental models. And modelers maybe are not domain experts. In fact, many of us are not domain experts. And so we really need to work with stakeholders um, and decision makers to identify what are the sorts of efforts that we should be paying attention to most, right? Like what are the things that we need to be operationalizing. What are the outcome variables that matter? What are the assumptions that are baked in? Do we care more about false positives or false negatives? Those change the sorts of modeling assumptions that we build as we're building the models themselves. So this kind of really deep engagement amongst stakeholders and modelers, I think is absolutely critical. And that's challenging. So we have to be able to bridge language divides, et cetera. The second piece is thinking about how models talk to each other. Um, so this is a question of model interoperability. Right now, because this space is so new and there's so much happening, um, I think very few of us have the luxury to think about, well, how might my model work with what OVARD is working on? And can they actually talk to each other? We know the literature has said, you know, conflict can contribute to food insecurity. We've also seen um, sort of research that has suggested food insecurity contributes to conflict. How can models that are looking at food insecurity talk to models that are thinking about conflict and vice versa? And the importance of doing that is because we know that different shocks can either amplify or dampen or kind of create feedback among outcomes for, for individuals who are potentially affected. So that kind of interoperability is, is critical. Likewise, thinking about cross-pollination and learning from modelers across the humanitarian space is super important. And I think this is part of what I'm so excited about for this particular panel is the opportunity to learn from what's happening in another, um, in another arena. Next slide, please. Lastly, I just want to end on a challenge. Um, does predicting conflict and linking it to anticipatory action change the likelihood of conflict itself? And I, I raise this question because I think there could be a real moral hazard issue that I struggle with. What if um, there are things that folks can do um, to say induce particular types of actions, right? And if the model is built um, with those in mind and people are able to kind of identify those, there's a potential risk there. Um, and this kind of question I think is especially important as we think about state actors who are involved in conflict themselves. Uh, and so I'll just leave it there as something that I, I grapple with and I'm looking forward to hearing everyone's questions. Um, thank you so much. Thanks, Aaron. And following on from uh, those two fantastic presentations, we now have Marie Wagner. She's a project manager at the Global Public Policy Institute and two years ago wrote a working paper that uh, laid out a lot of the key questions related to extending forecast based financing or anticipatory action to um, the field of conflict. And she'll give us a more practitioner and policy based um, understanding of, of what's there, the questions we have and recommendations for way forward. So I'll pass it over to you, Marie. 
Thanks so much. Thanks so much. Thanks, uh, Seth, for organizing this event and for writing the report and also for the inspiring talks from the from the former speakers and for giving me the opportunity to speak here. Um, as you said, my comments on the report come from the perspective of having researched international and national and institutional policies driving forward or hampering anticipatory humanitarian actions, especially with regards to expanding existing approaches to situations of violent conflict. So reading the report was extremely insightful and from the current state of research, I very much agree with the overall outcome. And most important for me is the clear differentiation between preventing violent conflict and aiming to mitigate the impacts. Because um, building anticipatory action frameworks on existing conflict prevention data and methods is indeed challenging since anticipatory humanitarian action does not have the, the same immediate goal as traditional conflict prevention. Anticipatory action aims at mitigating the anticipated impact of a hazard and not at preventing the hazard itself. So it seems to me as though we were jumping some steps ahead. Um, already anticipatory action for purely weather or climate related hazards is still a challenge, not only from the forecast data point of view, but also regarding coordination of different humanitarian actors, implementation policies or impact measurement. And at the same time, humanitarian actors have always acted upon anticipated onset or deteriorating violent conflict through protection monitoring. They've engaged in conflict risk analysis and, and planned activities accordingly without specific funding for this time window that anticipatory action targets after a pre-agreed threshold is reached and before the hazard hits or at least before the impacts are felt. So I would like to make two points for this discussion and link them to the commented uh, to recommended next steps. First, I think we need to clarify what we're actually talking about and what we want to prevent. If we want to prevent conflict from a humanitarian viewpoint, this is very vague, if not highly problematic. And the report shows that it is unclear what data we would even need for this. And currently, anticipatory action is certainly not the right approach. But if we can prepare humanitarian assistance, such as stockpiling medical equipment, dignity kits, or shelter for displaced people to prevent anticipated humanitarian impacts evolving from violent conflict, we can start talking. And if we're clear on what we want to prevent, we can come to my second point, that we need to consider what data we want to consult for forecasts in situations of violent conflict. Importantly, when expanding data analysis approaches from climate related disasters, risk assessments must include questions around power, epistemic justice and values. And when talking about anticipatory humanitarian action, how can activities be in line with humanitarian principles and ensure area based and whole of society approaches? So for, for this discussion and also moving forward, I would like to highlight three recommendations for researchers, humanitarian practitioners and policymakers. First, we should always define our key terms to make it easier to follow our argumentation. So when we say conflict, what type of uh, what type of conflict, what severity do we imply? What level of violence, number of fatalities, is it interstate or interstate conflict? Does it make a difference? We should always get this straight. And when we say anticipatory action, do we exclusively mean humanitarian action or also engaging other fields, which would raise other questions, actors, mandates? Second, we should consider the data production divide. What do I mean by that? While research does not show a clear cut so-called global north, global south divide regarding scientific capacity, there are geographical imbalances for the overall production of data. And we do see post-colonial structures, for example, in terms of databases for early warning systems and contingency plans, which are often produced and managed by international organizations only. And they might be technically accurate, but the metrics don't necessarily match the understanding of affected populations that an early warning system wants to warn. And in particular for situations of violent conflict, as the report also suggests, early warning systems and contingency plans should include perception data, expert opinions from people from or based in the project countries. And then third, also in line with the report's recommendation to move away, move away from asking if yes or no conflict will occur, should anticipatory humanitarian actors maybe move beyond the binary thinking as a yes no question when speaking about anticipatory action and conflict because i think it is rather a scale of opportunities linked to 
different indicators depending on data availability, data availability, volatility, the timeline, the type of conflict, and so on. So to summarize, I would argue that expanding anticipatory action to situations of violent conflict is worth pursuing, given that year after year conflict remains a main driver of humanitarian needs. But as ethical considerations are more contested in situations of violent conflict and the fear that it could be too political or counterproductive or even fuel the conflict are there, I think discussions about anticipating conflict should not only revolve around the sheer technical challenge of gathering and analyzing data, but also around the implications of the decision-making system. So first, what do we mean by conflict and impact? And if this is clarified, upon, one data, upon what data do we, can we and do we want to build early warning systems and contingency plans? Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much to uh, all the speakers. And I see that the audience has been uh, extremely uh, active in the in the chat box. So please keep posting your questions and comments. So I'll do my best to summarize, you know, some of the main topics that are coming up from uh, uh, from your questions and ask questions to the uh, to the panelists. So we have, um, you know, a bit of time for, uh, you know, uh, a discussion with uh, uh, our uh, experts. And maybe I can ask uh, all speakers to come on video uh, for uh, the panel discussion. And maybe to kick off the discussion, um, I would like to um, introduce um, our uh, first, last expert of, for today, that is Kata Yunkishi, that is the head of data science at the Armed Conflict Location and Event Data Project. So what we all know as ACLED. So yeah, so Kata Yun, so um, I mean, ACLED, you know, established, um, you know, uh, itself as a key data provider in this space and pretty much every researcher would end up, you know, on your website and most likely, you know, you would be uh, interacting with your uh, with your database. So I would like to um, hear from you, you know, your first reactions, you know, on on the report on the main uh, points that have been raised by uh, by the speakers and also like learning from you, you know, what's your thinking about, you know, conflict prediction. Thanks. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me and thank you for up to all the speakers for um, your very insightful thoughts. I'm really excited to be able to join the discussion. Um, we actually at ACLED are, are working on our own prediction model. So that hopefully will be coming out um, towards the end of the year this year. And coincidentally, a lot of the things that we've been working on actually are things that were mentioned um, in the paper that, um, that you all put out. So it was nice to see that we are sort of on the same page with a lot of things. And I think I'll focus on some of the main points that um, we sort of are, are focusing on and that we also saw you all mention, which is that it's really important, um, this transparency element of looking at what goes into these models, both in terms of what your data source is and some of the other panels mentioned that, you know, the definitions that you're using for conflict, do you have a fatality threshold for what institutes a, a conflict event? Is it um, only sort of armed clashes and battles between two actors? Is it state involved violence, et cetera? Uh, making it really clear what it is that you are predicting, um, I think can have a really big impact then on any sort of humanitarian analysis and outcome analysis that you want to do. Um, and at the same time, I, I agree with this idea of not focusing too much on sort of the theoretical inputs of these models, um, but also you don't want to go too far in the other direction of making it ununderstandable, you know, for people to, they don't really know exactly what predictors are going in. And it's really important to sort of show exactly what's going on under the hood with these models, what predictors are actually doing the work in terms of what the sort of end number is that you're showing. Um, one of the things that in our model that we're really gonna be focusing on is sort of this continuous measure that you all touched on is the direction that we should all be heading in, which we agree, um, looking at the, the number of events that are coming out and specifically the different types of events, because that I think also has a big impact um, on the humanitarian outcomes. If you have a conflict environment that is prone to a lot of battle events, that looks very different to a conflict environment that's focused on mainly violence against civilians, for example. So it's important to be able to predict the exact different types of conflict that you might see in addition to just in general, the trends of 
how it might escalate or how it might change over time. Um, and also sort of expanding our focus a bit more, I think, on giving some credit to looking at how conflicts intensify and might change over time and not perhaps being so focused on, are you predicting the onset cases? Are you predicting the next Ukraine, for example? Um, I think there's also value to be had in looking at how conflicts can morph over time rather than what peace environments are we seeing um, erupt into conflict overnight. Yeah, thanks. And um, so um, I would like maybe um, to follow up on um, uh, the issue of like what type of inputs we use in the, in these um, in these models. Maybe with uh, you, Avard, um, um, with the next questions. I think you know just trying to summarize one question from uh, uh, Al and one from Chiara about sort of like what is the balance between the quantitative information and the qualitative information, and what could be the role of experts and you mentioned in your presentation that you had a you know a competition where you also and you're trying to integrate as much as possible you know also expert judgment in your uh, in your work can you tell us a bit more about this and what is the value uh, the added value of this sort of like expert judgment in the prediction thanks yes um the so as as I mentioned in in the presentation is that lots lots of I mean, if we try to forecast the early stage of conflicts lots of what's really important goes on in the minds of uh, of uh, elite actors and there's lots of uncertainty even even inside their minds about the the effects of their own actions so um so it's it's obvious that expert expert assessments would be useful um. So we've done a pilot expert survey in views where we had um, 70 experts that that um, we, we asked them a quite broad range of questions, um, some some in terms of mapping the conflict issues in the country uh, and, and which other important stakeholders and so forth. And we also um, asked them about more directly what is your prediction what's the probability of at least 1000 deaths in in your country expertise over the next year um and what we find is that well their predictions their their simple predictions for one 1000 deaths for instance are not as good as the views model but uh, in combination the the the, the ensemble prediction of, of the views model and the expert is is somewhat better so there is clearly something to to be gained from from, from using this expert service so they are able to pick up um on on things that are happening a bit earlier so the problem for for views is that it's it's quite uh, resource intensive to to keep say you would in, for global reach would need uh, hundreds of experts that maybe if, if, if this is to be a really early warning system they will have to give assessments every month or so or so there are some practical constraints in order to set this up which which is challenging but it, it's it's clear from our pilot study that it's it's valuable um, um Thanks. That's really like I find it, you know, a very exciting and interesting stream uh, of uh, uh, of research indeed. Um, so maybe um, I would like maybe to move to um, Marie and Erin. I think there are several questions on, you know, how do we make sure that the models that we're building the research is actionable? How do we make sure that the models and the predictions are fit for purpose and that you know we provide the right information at the right time, but also in a clear way there are questions around sort of like uh, what type of actions you know conflict prediction uh, should uh, um, you know should inform and also like as humanitarians i mean you mentioned um uh, marie in your presentation that we should really like refocus potentially the the research at the level of the impact of of conflict and that's something that from your perspective, Erin, that's you know, that has been done in the field of uh, uh, of food security. So, can we maybe just think about sort of like how do we, as a community, sort of like can work together at the level of I mean to make sure that the models are actually useful and actionable for uh, humanitarian action. So maybe uh, starting from uh, uh, from you, Erin. So based on what you have learned from uh, uh, you know your work on uh, uh, on food security. Thanks. This is, um, I would say they're, they're not yet ready for prime time. Um, at least I don't think so. Um, I think, 
I think there's an opportunity here for for food security type models to be complementary. And what I mean by that is, you know, right now, so I can't speak to the conflict side as well, um, because that's not sort of the, the space that I, I know quite, I, I wouldn't say I, I, I would trust, I would trust my other, the other panelists to speak better to that. Um, but I would say that um, I think that sometimes it's easy to think that machine learning, because it says machine learning will be is kind of answering hard questions. But I actually think machine learning is maybe better suited to answering easy questions. And what I mean by that is where there are data rich environments, machine learning learning models do better. And so maybe what we want to be doing is kind of thinking about ways to utilize machine learning in places that are maybe data rich. And then we can use humans or humans can be certainly part of that process, but humans can then be the folks who are really dealing with the really challenging, tough problems. Um, you know, and I think that, so for me, this seems very much like this is another tool and it's a complement to what's already out there. I don't think it's going to replace what's already existing. Um, and so I think that this really speaks also to Ovard's point around these ensemble models where what, how do we kind of really incorporate domain expertise and end up in an even better space. Um, so that's that's sort of where, that's a big broad answer, but I think that's sort of where I, and my thinking has changed on this over time, frankly, um, but that's sort of where I'm thinking now. And so I'll turn it over to Marie. <laughs> yeah, no, thanks. And I see, you know, you're receiving a number of thumbs up. So I, I see that you know, also like the audience. So maybe uh, Marie, over to you. I mean, thinking about, you know, what we as, you know, sort of like humanitarians can use you know, conflict prediction models. So, so yeah, just, you know, you're thinking about sort of like what, you know, what type of, you know, focus um, that the model should have and what type of predictions. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I mean, what, what we did in this paper that Seth mentioned in the beginning is that we said that we should differentiate for at least two different types when we actually speak about anticipatory action and conflict based on what is being forecast. So if we look at, uh, for example, a climate-related hazard, hydrometeorological hazard, in a situation where there is also an ongoing conflict, then if we want to um, prevent the impacts of this hydrometeorological hazard, it, it isn't that like the actions, the actual humanitarian actions that are being done aren't that much different than what would usually be done in an anticipatory action framework. Uh, they, they would have to be in a more conflict sensitive way and they would have to be implemented in a different way, but the action wouldn't differ that much. And the same goes for the second time where we would actually try to prevent the impacts that come from a conflict or violent conflict itself, where also the 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 actual implementation, the actions that would come do not differ that much from what or do not differ at all from what humanitarian actions already look like. It's really only about this. But what's new about anticipatory action is the the way that funding can be triggered and the way the the, the policy idea behind it, the political um, let's say the, the commitment to fund anticipatory actions based on a forecast, based on a risk, rather than based on a needs assessment. So the actions themselves would aren't that like, th this is not really the new part of it. And I would maybe like to play one question back to Aaron, if I may, to, to link this, <laughs> because in like prevention of famine and famine prediction is something that's already been done. So I was wondering, is um, but and it is also if there is already something that's closely linked to conflict, but not addressed as much because starvation can also be used as a weapon. So, do you or any of the other panelists maybe think that this could be used as an entry point for that? That's a really good question. Um, I'll, I'll let my other panelists go first if they have a, if they've got thoughts while I collect mine. Um, you know. I think, I mean, I think, you know, I think that, that conflict and kind of tactics of starvation happen now um, and have happened historically. Um, and I think that my, I think that, that my sense is that, yeah, it's a, it's a good question. I mean, I, I think that it would be, Kind of going back to my to the question I had posed in the PowerPoint, it to me feels 
slightly more removed um, than maybe folks saying, oh, well, if we do these sorts of things, then that might release, you know, resources in a particular way. Um, I think that that maybe the chain feels a little bit shorter as it relates to conflict and anticipatory action. Um, but I might be being naive about that. Um, I'd be curious to hear what my other panelists think about this as well. Maybe we give a you know a few minutes to the panelists to think about that. And I think you know some, some um, you know this will come up also in the following uh, discussion. I'm sure. So maybe I want to dig a little deeper on the issue of uh, sensitivity. So uh, and maybe you know given your experience with uh, uh, you know with conflict data, uh, maybe uh, uh, for you, uh, Kata, you. And there are several questions from um, from the audience, both at the level of you know like. How do we make sure that these models are used, you know, to do good? You know, that are that are, you know, how do we make sure, you know, people don't misuse this type of models? But also questions around the sensitivity uh, at the level of the inputs that we use uh, for these models. So, and I would like to hear your thoughts about this. Thanks. So, I think on the first point, I mean, yeah, that's a that's a great question. I mean. I think as far as on our end of things as not being policymakers, the most we can do is provide as much information contextually as possible. I think that that last point is kind of key that we need to explain what the shortcomings are of the predictions. We need to explain sort of how it fits into the larger conflict environment and what the past trends of that conflict environment can be. We need to sort of be able to give in as little information as possible, as little snapshot as possible all of the information about the past, present, and future tense of that conflict environment um, in order for people not to just see one forecast and then run with it. Um, they need to see sort of how it kind of can fit in. And, and I think that's really the most that we can do in terms of hoping people use this information responsibly. Um, as far as the, the sort of data collection aspect of it, um, I mean, I think that having sort of a, a global as local as possible data collection method is really key. I saw some questions come up in the chat about um, like local surveys or trying to sort of crowdsource materials, et cetera. Um, we, I mean, I think as a, from a methodology data collection perspective, I would shy away from sort of mass crowdsourced models. Um, it's really difficult to verify information that comes in that way, especially when you're talking about conflict environments. Um, at ACLID, we rely on sort of the most diverse set of sources that we can. And to get that sort of local richness, we partner with local organizations and geos that are on the ground that are perhaps doing their own data collection or can at least advise us on the data that we do collect, how accurate it is, and is it really filling in the gaps in terms of what's being um, reported about that environment? Are we creating sort of an accurate picture of what's happening? Um, and I think sort of merging all of those different local methodologies is also a really important thing for data collectors. You can't just take what, you know, five different organizations are reporting about conflict and, and stick them together. They can have completely different methodologies and how they are collecting conflict and you need to be able to synchronize those. Um, so I'm happy to go on and on about this topic, but I'll let uh, others chime in. Yeah, no, and maybe um, let me get back to you, um, uh, Alvard. I mean, I, especially on this idea, you mentioned sort of like the possibility of using expert judgment and super forecasters. What the, you know, how are you also thinking about this idea of crowdsourcing and self-reporting of conflict as one of the inputs, or that's something that you're not considering at the moment? No, we're not considering that at the moment. Um, I mean, I think um, there are too many sensitive, just too, too too many um, reasons not to be. Uh, to be reporting on, on these events for, for local populations. And, and uh, well, I, I think there will be lots of ethical um, concerns in, in, in doing that in a conflict setting. So, um, so I, I'm quite sure that the, the information we would retrieve would be quite biased. Um, just if I can comment on a couple of things. So what, one is a, um, the question of um, what are the impacts of doing these predictions as our area? Uh, Erin mentioned that, and there's been mentioned later too. So, our standard response has been that we we cannot compete with the information situation for the local actors. So, um, 
So the, there is no way that we as, as uh, um, academics trying to make global systems with uh, scant data sources can, can compete with, uh, with local governments and local um, violent actors. So, but we can, so I think it's, there's a much larger danger in, in forgotten conflicts and forgotten risks and, and just overseeing all, all, all the violence which is going on or which, which is threatened. Um, so so that, that's my standard response to the concern that the, the advantages outweigh the concerns, but that doesn't mean that uh, it's not a concern. And in particular, if, if a system is of a type that uh, actors act on as an organization, for instance, that makes a very big difference. So, so we, we find it easier for ourselves that we are academic actors that do not really uh, make any actions on, on the predictions we make. So we, and it's up to organizations to do what they want based on what we produce. Um, so another thing is input data. Um, just, um, I, I agree that I mean, the most important input data for these efforts is the conflict data uh, set themselves and uh, big credit to ACLID and USDP for, for doing lots of work to, to um, to collect these data sources with, without the, these humongous efforts, uh, it wouldn't be possible to do any of the work that we are doing. But um, just one small challenge to, to ACLID is that um, the, the, data, the data are very uncertain and it's, um, it's very important to be, to have an open dialogue on, on, on what is the real situation about uh, um, armed conflict events or political violence events. Um, and I said that USDP is the most transparent source, uh, and I would like to hear a bit about the ability for research to do systematic comparisons between the various data sources. So currently the actual terms of use doesn't um, um, allow for that. So um, some, so that's a call for transparency on, on the input side too. So. Um, Recognizing that ACLID is an enormously strong data source, it's very important that uh, it can be scrutinized as, as closely as possible. If I can just comment on that really quick. Um, essentially, not quite what our terms of use say. We, of course, encourage everyone to look closely at our data um, and to make any comparisons that they wish. We only ask that they're done in good faith, that they are done with an understanding of our methodology, of the methodology of others that you're comparing us to. Um, and I think that's with, you know, everyone's best interest in mind. Um, if you're going to be comparing two different methodologies and making claims about different data sets, they should be done in good faith and done responsibly. So. Good. Yeah, thanks. And that was also like, that's also one of the recommendations of, uh, you know, uh, our research to be able to be, you know, in a transparent way to be able to uh, evaluate these, uh, uh, these models and also from the perspective of, of the models to clearly sort of like identify the limitations and you know the scope within which the, the, the these models uh, should be used um there are some technical questions actually so maybe let's go uh, to you Seth um there are uh, a couple of questions one from uh, uh, Andrea on uh, how do we define conflict? And I know that, you know, in your research, you have looked at the different definitions used by different groups and this, you know, um, you know, it can be challenging to give, you know, a, a clear definition and also, and also about sort of like when you evaluate the accuracy of a prediction is uh, for a specific use, right? So, and you said in your presentation that we have done this evaluation with anticipatory action uh, in mind. So if you can maybe talk about um, sort of like what type of actions and applications you had in mind uh, when, you know, uh, you know, in your assessment that, you know, using models alone is probably, you know, um, too early. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. I think um, I'll start with the first question just on the definition of conflict. I think all of this comes back to this uh, topic of, uh, I think, transparency and availability of metrics, really. So, I mean, our paper from the start was constrained by what models were publicly available in ha having their metrics for performance assessed and published. We, you know, 
in a type of literature review, an expansive research project that we're undertaking, we obviously don't have the capacity to reconstruct and test all the wide range of models that are out there. I mean, Ova mentioned their competition for, you know, escalation, you know, there's 14 papers that came out this year with models. So there's certainly no possibility that we could reproduce all of that. So we were, we were constrained in what researchers had already set out as the definition of conflict. And often, um, probably up until the most recent years, that's been um, setting a threshold, usually based on fatalities, um, in a certain time frame and area, say, 10 fatalities in uh, sort of one one month in a country or, uh, you know, 55 fatalities in a month in a country Th that that's was set as conflict uh, as defined. And then if it was 54, you suddenly don't reach the threshold, for instance. And I, I think there's a lot of work being done now in developing continuous models that instead predict just the number, for instance, of uh, of fatalities without having to dig into the kind of defining what conflict is. But this is this, I think, goes back to Marie Wagner's point, which is we need to be having these conversations on what conflict is, what we want to be predicting, and using that to inform what researchers are doing. And more importantly, coming over to the impact really of conflict is, is often maybe what we're, we're, we're more interested on the anticipatory action side. So for the question on how did we assess the performance, it was difficult because Really, if you look at some of the papers that have assessed performance of anticipatory action modeling in for the drought space, they're based on specific predictions of uh, an outcome on populations and looking at how costly those interventions are on that impact. And we just didn't have that data available. It just currently doesn't exist. And so we're hoping that, again, pushing this research agenda forward, that we can generate a, a wealth of evidence that can be then applied, particularly by humanitarians, to say, okay, we can build costing models on top of predictions of impact to start really assessing the feasibility of application there. And I think really our point is that is a, that's exactly it. That's the bare minimum that we need for application. So since that doesn't exist, we don't think, you know, given the you know complexities of conflict, given its prevalence across many of the most severe humanitarian crises today, that should be done as like that kind of bare minimum work before we start applying anticipatory action to conflict there. Yeah, thanks. And I see that we only have a, a few minutes left and it's hard actually to keep track of all the questions. So thank you very much to uh, the audience that is, you know, uh, really uh, engaged. So what we will do is also like we will uh, share the transcript of the of the chat and address some of the uh, issues that are coming up in the chat. There are questions on how to we integrate new technologies about the interoperability of models and something that you have also mentioned Erin, in your uh, presentation. But really like this all sort of like this, the research that we have done, this event is really meant to be the starting point for future research. So we are doing all this to really in, you know, hoping that this will foster the collaboration between humanitarian practitioners and technical partners to really make sure that we, you, we make advancement on, on this agenda. So two minutes left. I would like to really uh, just wrap up with, uh, um, you know, rapid fire from uh, uh, the panelists uh, on um, sort of like, future plans, what you hope to achieve, let's say in two, three, you know, three years, and what could be a measure of success in uh, three years. So we, we have been successful if we, so over to you and maybe who wants to start? I'll go ahead. So, um, I think for, for me, I think success in two years would be if we can, as a humanitarian community, and spe I mean, specifically from my perspective as UN OCHA, actively engage in this space in terms of contributing to model developments through potentially using our, the networks we have across the kind of most conflict affected countries to generate local data and human inputs to try and test their ability to extend these uh, predictions of conflict to predictions of humanitarian impact. And through that, maybe it's optimistic in two or three years, being able to then, yeah, get to this assessment of how is that, how is that performing? And can we start looking at anticipatory action in this space? I can, I can get it. Thanks, Erin. 
Um, I think we'll be successful in two to three years if we can figure out better bridges between stakeholders and modelers. So making sure those models are in fact fit for purpose and everything that folks have been saying about transparency, reproducibility, making sure the limitations and assumptions are clear, making sure we understand what we're modeling. Like, what do we mean by conflict? It's a huge question and that will be a huge move if we can get there. Great, thanks. Yeah, and that's also like why we're here today. So thanks, Erin. Um, Marie, please. Yeah, I can go next. Um, everything that Erin said, plus <laughs> that I think um, I, I, I mean, I'm a true believer in anticipatory humanitarian action. I really am. But I just hope that we, to be successful, we should not try to make this just because it's new and just because there might be more funding coming in to make this fit for everything, all the problems that are there in the humanitarian world, but to really improve anticipatory humanitarian action as it is. Over. Thanks. So very quickly, we have the, the modelers left. Do you have anything to add? Sure, I can say, um, I think, yeah, I think success to me would be that these kinds of forecasts are something that's used along with a lot of um, more sort of qualitative expert level opinions and decision making. Um, I don't anticipate, nor do I, nor do I think it should be the case that predictions are used sort of as the sole tool for, um, for anticipatory action, but hopefully it has a bigger place at the table in terms of the, the conversation. Okay, I'll, I'll go next. So um, I also agree that the interaction between stakeholders and modelers is really key. I think that's necessary to, to have impact in terms of, of the usefulness of the models, but also to, to produce better models. I also think, I hope to achieve to be producing models of other imp of the impacts of armed conflict and look forward to try to engage with others that are um, trying to forecast droughts and food security and then health consequences and so forth. Um, final thing that um, I hope to achieve is um, to have a better understanding of the uncertainty of our forecasts. So uh, understood in a broad sense, I think that's important both for credibility and for performance. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, we definitely have a full plate. So also from you know the the questions in the in the chat, you see that there's uh, you know great engagement. So yeah, as I said, um, so this is really the starting point. We have a lot of work uh, ahead, and we really hope that this is helping you know like the two communities to uh, to interact in a in a in a fruitful way. So thank you very much to all the speakers. Thanks for uh, joining today. Thanks for. Uh, all the participants, so I hope you enjoyed and yeah, please don't hesitate to uh, reach out if you have questions, comments, if you want to know more, we will be sharing the recording, the, uh, the transcript of the, um, uh, of the chat, the slides, but then there will be much more uh, to come. Thank you very much.